If it's Friday, seeing red, Republican leader Mitch McConnell caps off a tough week with his own party in disarray as Republican Senate candidates struggle all over the campaign trail and Biden's agenda gets an unexpected boost in divided Washington. Plus, bridging the divides, there's emerging agreement among Democrats. It's about time to give Biden a legislative victory. But there's emerging disagreement on whether Biden should remain the party's leader. I'll talk to a progressive Democrat, Congressman Ro Khanna, on where his party goes from here. And later, the latest severe weather event amid a growing climate crisis as Kentucky declares a major disaster after disastrous flooding kills more than a dozen people. We're on the ground with the latest rescue efforts and yet another extreme weather event. Welcome to Meet the Press. Now I'm Chuck Todd. If it's Friday, a bad week from Republicans just got worse for Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell, thanks in part to the influence of Donald Trump. It was a new Fox uh, poll out of Battleground, Pennsylvania, that really put this into focus. It's a race that could determine control of the Senate. It has Republican Mehmet Oz down double digits to Democrat John Fetterman, even as Oz has had the campaign trail to himself for weeks, with Fetterman still recovering from a stroke. He's not really on the campaign trail as much. If you'll recall, establishment Republicans like McConnell raised concerns about Oz's candidacy. This poll shows you why. But they couldn't trump the power of Trump's endorsement. By the way, Oz's personal ratings are upside down. He's minus 20. Uh, a favorable rating, 35, 55, just a disaster there already. Same story in Georgia, uh, another key battleground state for Senate control. The Trump back uh, Republican, Herschel Walker, is down four points to incumbent Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock in that Fox poll. He's down even further in others. The Trump opposed Republican, Brian Kemp, is up three points in the governor's race over Democratic challenger Stacey Abrams. In fact, the best thing Kemp has going for him is Trump's ire. It is clearly helping him with independence. Trump's influence is also causing Republicans headaches in other battleground contests from Ohio, where the Trump candidate is not performing well, to Arizona, where Trump chased away the only good candidate they had in the Senate race. And now they're struggling with a bunch of people that are trying to run like Trump. And then, of course, there's Michigan reinforcing some Republican concerns that Trump is picking primary candidates with an eye towards loyalty and not electability. And the new polling from the campaign trail follows McConnell's tough stretch on Capitol Hill, where he was put in an uncommon position of being outmaneuvered by his Senate Democratic colleague, Chuck Schumer. And McConnell and Republicans were caught flat-footed by the announcement of a reconciliation agreement between Joe Manchin and Chuck Schumer, something Republicans thought was dead. I guess they're mad. I can't figure out who they're mad at. They think, is it Joe Manchin? Do they think Manchin double-crossed them? What kind of promise did they think Manchin was making? Some interesting questions here we'd like to get answers to. And in the scramble, Republicans may have made some unforced errors, like their sudden about-face that blocked a popular bipartisan bill to help veterans uh, who have medical problems from fighting in Iraq. Meanwhile, on the other side of the aisle, Democrats are, and we haven't been able to say this very often, having a pretty decent week. Dare we call them in array? Legislative action could be just what President Biden needs to show voters that a Democratic majority in Washington can be competent and potentially effective. Are these stumbles enough to cost Republicans control of Congress in November? On the House side, probably not. There are a lot of variables, and Republicans still enjoy an advantage in the overall sour political environment facing Democrats, thanks mostly to today's inflation report. In a week where Republicans would have liked nothing more than to be calling attention to this week's tough economic headlines, here we are looking at a party somewhat in disarray in Washington and on the campaign trail. And that party is not the Democrats. Ali Vitale's on Capitol Hill, Forrest Vaughn Hilliard's on the ground in Battleground, Arizona. That's where there's a big primary on Tuesday that's going to decide the fate of how deep is Trumpism inside the GOP. Ali, let me start with you. Let's start on the Capitol Hill side of things. I still want to get my arms around, who do the Republicans think double-crossed them? Is it Joe Manchin? Did they get some promise for him that we don't know about? I, I don't know if it's Manchin, though I asked him yesterday if he duped McConnell on this. And he says, well, I hope that Republicans don't feel that way. And then I asked Schumer about it, and he said something similar. But it feels a little bit like, okay, maybe that wasn't their outright goal in announcing this deal. But if that's one of the ancillary things that comes from it, oh, okay, they're happy to look like, strateg like brilliant strategists on this. 
in a rare moment of outmaneuvering Mitch McConnell, who usually is so deep in the weeds and has his pulse on this building. So certainly that's one of the upsides, however accidental or non-accidental, for Manchin and Schumer. But the other piece of this, too, is that the fallout of Republicans looking like they retaliated both on the PACT Act and then yesterday in the House on the CHIPS Plus bill is really palpable here in Washington. I mean, First of all, on, on the chips piece of it, this is something that many Dem that many Republicans spoke favorably about, mm -hmm. and then their leadership was whipping them against it. And then on the PACT Act, it really does look indefensible when yeah. you put it in the terms that John Stewart put it in, so much so that even just in the last few minutes, I got a release from Senator Pat Toomey's office, again, trying to explain yeah. himself on this because he's really feeling the heat. No, I, I, Ali, I think, look, this bill's going to pass. They're, they're, they're looking for quick cover. Oh, we're just waiting on yeah. an amendment, and suddenly they're going to be very supportive of that amendment. Totally. I think we see that coming. But, Ali, let me ask this. It, 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 are, are just Senate Republicans just surprised that they, don't, they didn't get to outmaneuver Chuck Schumer again? I mean, is that really what this is about? They're just so used to winning? I think that that is a large part of it. I think they love the idea of Democrats in disarray. And I love the way you put it, Democrats in array, because this is a week where it really did feel like they were marching in lockstep towards the same goal, aside from the little snafu that they had over the assault weapons ban in the House today, which we can put aside because the larger message out of this week is the fact that they are finally going to get something transformative, in the words of many Democrats, done on this reconciliation piece of it. But I also thought that it was interesting yesterday, people People like John Thune were using words like blindsided when it came to the Mansion and Toomey deal, when it came to the Mansion, sorry, different deal, Mansion and, and Schumer deal um, earlier this week. He's saying blindsided. But then other Republicans that I was talking to said, yeah, well, we were sort of under the impression that there would be a reconciliation deal at some point. We just weren't aware that it was coming when it did. I was just going to say, it's sort of like if you're blindsided, then you're willfully not following right. Washington. Like exactly. you're willfully not doing your job or you're watching propaganda me media and not some straightforward journalism like what you deliver us, Ms. Vitale. Let me oh, move thanks. over to the battleground here uh, and in Arizona, because it really is ground zero for Trump's influence in the party and for sort of the position the Republicans find themselves in a favorable political environment that they're doing everything they can to neutralize with bad candidates. Um, you're on the ground. It's a bizarre split in Arizona, both in that Senate and gubernatorial race. What are you finding, Vaughn? Right. I mean, let's see. Pennsylvania, Ohio, Georgia, Chuck, are suddenly more questionable Senate seats for Republicans and whether they're able to hold on to these seats. And when you come here and look at Arizona, you're looking at Mark Kelly, the Democratic incumbent, uh, squaring up against what is still a competitive Republican field. But you see two names that are at the uh, at the top of the list right now in terms of polling. And that is Blake Masters, who is the former right hand of Peter Thiel, the tech billionaire. And then you've got Jim Lehman, who is a solar company, uh, solar power company executive here in town. And both of these individuals, you could call Trump acolytes, who have said that they would have object to uh, the 2020 presidential uh, certification if they were still in the U.S. Senate. Uh, Blake Masters, of course, was the one who picked up the Trump endorsement here this summer. And you have seen him start to slowly pull away in some of these polls here. And I was talking with Jim Lehman uh, last night after a mm -hmm. campaign event, and I asked him about that Trump endorsement. And he said that, you know, Donald Trump had made other, quote, bad picks in the past. And he directly referenced Pennsylvania in the endorsement of Mehmet Oz, where we see now John Fetterman with, in some polls, a double digit lead. And that is where he was sending up warning signals about the potential candidacy of Blake Masters. Meanwhile, Masters has continued to stay in line with Donald Trump, yet also saying uh, that he contrasts himself with the likes of Martha McSally, who lost the Senate race here in 2018 right. and 2020. Just take a listen to when I pose a question to him, how he would explain himself politically now alongside Donald Trump. Take a listen. I'm my own guy. You know, I'm not trying to copy Trump's mannerisms or anything like that, but his policies were great. The America first agenda that, that you know, we got a lot of it done. We didn't get all of it done, but it was great. It's why everybody in this state was basically better off four years ago. And so I'm not going to run away from that success. Whether it's Blake Masters or Jim Lehman, they intend, Chuck, to run on a Trump message. Whether it works, that's the big question. You know, Vaughn, Ma one of Martha McSally's problems was I don't think uh, Trump folks thought she was a real Trumpist. Uh, and, it, you know, the establishment was wondering what she's doing when you do this. 
When you look at laymen and masters, are they true believers or are they saying what they think Trump wants to hear? And can you discern it? From my discerning of it, I think that they are both individuals who understand politically here to win a Republican primary. Uh, You've got to galvanize that extra support that came in from some of the rural parts of the state for as much focus as we put on Maricopa County here. uh, Republicans lost margins, not only Donald Trump, but also Martha McSally here. And that is where you saw Donald Trump outperform Martha McSally in the 2020 election and only lose by 10,000 votes. And it was in the rural areas that, you know, Blake Masters, Jim Lane, and they understand they've got to drive some of that new Trump support to make up for some of the losses here in the suburbs that they know is going to roll over here into 2022. Well, it has always been a fascinating Republican Party. The Arizona Republican Party has always been very bright line divided. It just doesn't always make it into the national scene, but it certainly is this time. Vaughn Hilliard, thank you. And Ali, I'm not letting you go here for a second. Even though we were with Vaughn in Arizona, I got to ask you about Arizona's other senator. Very quickly, Kirsten Cinema. Any indication yet if she's supporting this deal or not? No. And, you know, her vibe up here is that she doesn't talk with reporters. Mm -hmm. We've tried repeatedly. But I think the interesting thing here is when I got some one-on-one time with Schumer yesterday, I asked if he's spoken to her. He won't even say as much as that. He's just said he wants to give everyone in his caucus a few days to read this. Mm -hmm. The reality is they can't really do it until Wednesday anyway, because with Dick Durbin testing positive for COVID, his fifth day is actually Wednesday. So they have a little bit of time here to get their ducks in a row, but they also can't afford any unforeseen absences either. Yeah, I think Democratic senators need to mask up uh, if they want to get this reconciliation through. Anyway, Vaughn Hilliard, Ali Vitale, thank you both for getting us started. I want to turn now to someone who knows a thing or two about running in a Republican primary these days in the shadow of Donald Trump with maybe quiet support from Mitch McConnell. And that is Pat McCrory. He's the former Republican governor of North Carolina. He lost to a Trump-backed candidate in May during that North Carolina Senate primary. He joins me now. And and, and Governor McCrory, you've not been shy uh, about your views here about what's happening to the party there's a lot of hand wringing today here in Washington. You're probably your phone's probably been buzzing about what the heck is going on? Georgia, Pennsylvania. People are looking at Arizona going, what's happening there? It's like it looks like Nevada is about the only place that Senate Republicans are truly behind a candidate that they think they can win. Have the establishment been too quiet? Are they too afraid of Donald Trump? Well, I think there's several factors that haven't been mentioned. One is you got to remember in North Carolina and Pennsylvania, Ohio, and now you're seeing in Arizona and Missouri, there's these are some tough hardball primaries. And even after the victor comes across the line, primarily because of Trump's support and a lot of money, there's some hard feelings. And some of that support is not being transferred to the general election from even the Republicans. And then you have the independent voter status. For example, in my state, uh, the majority of voters in North Carolina now are independent voters. 35% of the voters are independent. And so they're sitting on the sideline watching this in purple states. In fact, Ohio, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Georgia, Arizona are all purple states. They go back and forth in presidential elections and in Senate elections. And you've got that dynamic. So the Democrats didn't have those tough primaries. The Republicans right. are in the defensive seats. Another factor very quickly is you have in Pennsylvania, you're retiring um, Pat Toomey, a more moderate type of uh, senator who wasn't attached to Trump. In North Carolina, you're replacing Richard Burr, yeah. a, a person who voted for impeachment, but got a lot of independent votes six years ago. You've got... Um, in, in uh, Ohio, Portman. Right. So those dynamics are still occurring, and there's still some raw feelings from the primaries, well, right. and I'm more, you're, you're going to have that in Arizona, too. You're speaking in the third person, but it sounds like you still have some raw feelings about your primary. Oh, yeah. I mean, in all, has Ted Budd reached out to you? No. No. Are I've you had kidding other me? people reach out to me. No. The candidate himself, it's been three mo- almost three months now. No, but that's um, that's the difficulty in these races right now. Uh, There's still some scabs and some wounds from the primary, which the Democrats aren't having to deal with. But the Democrats are having their own issues. As you know, they're they're avoiding Biden at all costs. Well, but that gets back. But you, you actually this is why I wanted to talk to you about this. Yeah, look, 
Mitch McConnell was aware of this problem when this cycle began. You know, yeah. he, you know, the opposition research book on Herschel Walker was made essentially public. They were begging yeah. the Repub Donald Trump to back off of him. Um, you certainly were not discouraged from running by many people in, in the traditional wing of the Republican Party. But once they got candidates, they didn't fight for them. That's what I've noticed. And it yeah. seems as if that's is that why a Doug Ducey's not even running for the Senate? Yes, I think it is. I had talked to Ducey early on in the process when I was 30 points up. <laughs> and I said, it doesn't make any difference. We can win this if you're a former or current governor. But the dynamics change. And I think the dynamics six to eight months ago was the economy's turning bad. Biden's numbers mm -hmm. are so bad. Um, no matter who's nominated in the state, we're going to win, even in purple states. And we got some celebrity types of people in Ohio and mm -hmm. Pennsylvania. We got a person with a lot of money and bud in the Club for Growth. Georgia, you got a football star. It played great in the primary. The dilemma is in the general election with the independents. And that's what's going to determine these elections in the Senate majority, just like presidential elections. It, they're all going to be very close races. The Republicans, I think, will become get closer in both Pennsylvania and right. definitely in Ohio well, and of course. Uh, Arizona. But there's still going to be some wounds in Arizona since it's such a late primary. You know, you brought up, I, I thought you made an interesting observation there about Portman, Burr, Toomey versus Oz, Vance, and and Bud here. You, you know, it's interesting. Roy Blunt, Roy Blunt in Missouri. And we also have Roy Blunt in Missouri. You know, I, I also bring up the abortion issue. You know, all of you are pro-life, but, but some of you are for sort of what would be seen as mainstream exceptions. And then some of these candidates that have gotten nominated are not necessarily for that. And it seems like that's creating more of a problem with independent voters. Do you get that sense? Well, I think part of the issue with the social issues, first of all, I've always realized there's no winning in social issues on both sides. Right. And uh, there's just surviving. Because, right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's political science, regardless of where you stand on those issues. But the, the issues um, really go back to the state legislature and the Senate candidates don't have much control of the state legislature, whether you're in a liberal state or a conservative state. And then you've got you know, unique situations where you might have a Democratic governor, Republican legislature, or vice versa. So there's a lot of division within these states that uh, I frankly think most of the senators are attempting to avoid at all right. costs. In fact, where a lot of the Republicans are playing the Biden game right now and hiding. Right. Um, Look, it's hard to find Ted Bud. Let me ask you this. Let me let me leave you. Let me let, let me get you out with this question. What would it take for you to get behind Ted Bud's candidacy? I'd like to talk to him. I, I don't know him. <laughs> I, I, I probably said a total of 15, 20 words because he used a very effective tool in our primary was, was to get the Trump endorsement, get Club for Growth, and avoid all debates. Um, so he used a technique that some Democrats were very successful in in the past. Herschel Walker right. looks like maybe doing the same thing. And you see the Democrats also not really out there uh, – in fact, I'm seeing retail politics dying. Uh, people are relying on commercials Social or media. coordinated very yeah. few press conferences anymore compared to 10 to 15 years ago. Well, that you're right on. Uh, and as a just an old fashioned on the stump political reporter, I miss that. And I miss that a lot. And I know yeah, you do Obama too. Obama and uh, yeah. Trump took retail politics to another level. And ever since then, no one can reach that level. So you're going, what the heck? I'm yeah, going to rely you, on. You may be right. Uh, Pat McCrory, the former governor of North Carolina, uh, one thing about you is you don't, uh, you're not shy, uh, and you tell us what you think, and I appreciate it. Take care. You got it. We're going to have much more on the upcoming primaries next week when Kristen Walker and myself host the latest Meet the Press election night special Tuesday, August 2nd. This is a huge night, the biggest night in August. Missouri, Alabama, uh, Missouri, Arizona, Michigan, Kansas, Washington State. It is this pretty super Tuesday. Don't miss it. 9 p.m. Eastern, right here on NBC News Now. Coming up, is America ready for a new political party? Most third parties fail, but a group of former elected officials and political leaders swear this time is different. We'll dig into that story and what it says about the state of our broken politics next. It's true. We are aliens. But what are you going to do about it? It's a two-party system. 
You have to vote for one of us. He's right. This is a two-party system. Well, I believe I'll vote for a third-party candidate. Go ahead. Throw your vote away. <laughs> Welcome back. A lot of Americans are fed up with politics as usual, and they don't approve of the job either political party is doing. But as that Simpsons clip amusingly reminds us, like it or not, this is a two-party system. As I always say, there aren't three teams of the Super Bowl. There are only two. Still, according to a recent Suffolk University USA Today poll, 60% of voters say that a third party or multiple parties are necessary to represent their political views. And earlier this week, we saw a bipartisan group of former officials announce a new national party called Forward, insisting that even though other recent third party movements have failed to gain traction, there's one. I'm joined now by my panel for the day, Eugene Scott, political reporter for The Washington Post, Doug Jones, a former Democratic senator from the state of Alabama, and Sarah Chamberlain, Republican strategist and president of the Republican Main Street Partnership. You're, you guys are like almost two perfect representatives of the two parties <laughs> to discuss this because if you were on the ballot, this third party would have hurt you, Doug Jones. A centrist third party in Alabama would have made it impossible, perhaps, for Democrats to win, or certainly a moderate Democrat to win. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know, Chuck, I'm not sure exactly in a state like Alabama mm -hmm. uh, because there are moderate Republicans in Alabama as well. And it would depend on who the other nominee. But didn't they be. vote for you? Uh, they voted for me yeah. uh, the last time or in 2017. Yeah. A lot of them did not do that in 2020. So I, I think it could go either way. I think it really will depend on who the candidates are in any particular election. You know, Sarah, you, the, the group you represent, <laughs> there's some of these people that used to be part of a Republican Main Street par Partnership that are on this. I mean, it, it, to, to me, the moderate Republicans have been trying to figure out, do, do you fight inside the party or do you fight outside it to reform? What say you? you got to fight inside. Mm -hmm. A third party, I think, is, is not doable. I think um, Bloomberg took a very strong look at that. He was willing to invest a couple billion dollars in it, and he said, I can't do it. It's not going to work. So our argument within Republican Main Street Partnership is you got to stay in the party, fight within it, vote in primaries. If you want to turn the Republican Party around, you've got to vote in primaries and generals. You know, Eugene, to me, the lesson of third parties in the past, when they've been successful, it's that they reformed the two major parties. Mm. You know, Ross Perot's 19 percent got the Democrats thinking about deficit reduction and Republicans rethinking free trade. Mm -hmm. So in a weird way, he impacted the direction of both parties for a decade, even as his party failed. Could at least this folks have that kind of impact on the two parties or not? Well, first, they're going to have to come up with some clear policy ideas, which they have not articulated in a way that... It's compromise, not a white paper? <laughs> no, let, let's ask voters, yeah. right? And so people don't want to just vote for a third party. They want to vote for some ideas and a vision of America that they don't see being pushed forward in the existing parties. And so far, from what I've read, Forward hasn't made clear what they're about. Well, I think we know what they're about. It's about they're just frustrated with the two parties, sure. Doug, right? But I, I, I totally agree with Sarah, though. I think you have to do this within the parties, and you have to get people to vote. The problem that we're seeing is that people say that a lot, and then they, they vote, and we see candidates running on the far right, far left, because that's where things are. We've gotten so damn gerrymandered mm -hmm. in this country, that that, and that's a huge problem. If we could fix that, I think we could get back to the center a little bit more. But I do think it's a, pro a problem. I agree with Sarah. I just think you start within the parties, and you try to convince the parties. It may be a little bit longer term, but that's where you go. But the Go primary ahead. turnouts are so small. Yes. I mean, you're, you're fighting for a small sliver right. of the party, and they usually tend to be the extremes, frankly, right. of both parties. It's that middle of the road that we have to educate them. You've got to vote in your primary. It's I'll more honest, important than ever. I, as, for the last 30 years, I've always wanted to, I want to see a third party populate, mm -hmm. but I actually think the better reform that's out there is top four ranked choice voting or top five. If you want to fix this extremism inside the two parties, the turnout problem you're talking about, is that the better solution? It seems to be popular in the places where it exists, and there are other people, obviously, in states where it doesn't exist who are advocating for it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this is something that Forward could, you know, take the lead on and therefore perhaps change how voting looks, and that could be winsome and actually make them way more attractive uh, for people who are looking to see some real change. All right, I want to pivot here, because we got some really blunt talk from Pat McCrory here a few minutes ago. And Sarah, i got to start with you. Mm -hmm. It's astonishing to me. We're near three months since the North Carolina primary. And we're talking about all these divides inside the Republican. I mean, he's right. These primaries are hurting the Republicans. Mm -hmm. So begin the process of healing. And, and I haven't seen a McCormick-Oz uh, big reunion tour either, either in Pennsylvania. What's happening? I have no idea, but they've got to start to unite. 
and they've got to come together. But I think he said he didn't even receive a phone call from the gentleman who that beat him. I mean, is this, we have how, to is call this a civil war in the party? A bit of a civil war. Mm. Yeah. You're absolutely. not supposed to call it that. But I know. It, 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 right, I but know. It, but it, I mean, there is. And, and we've lost common courtesy. I mean, call each other and concede. But we have we've forgotten our manners and, and to some extent. And this has existed for a while, though, within the GOP, whether or not we acknowledge it as uh, a civil war now or not. I mean, very early on, we saw people being very clear that if you're not with Trump, you're almost a Democrat, and yeah. therefore we won't even acknowledge you, despite the fact that you may have a longer track record of conservatism than Trump himself. Right. Oddly enough, sometimes the, quote, moderate Republicans are seen as the bigger enemy inside yeah. the Republican Party they are than, now. than is the Democrats. Yeah. They're, they're, they're certainly seen that way now. And I think to some extent that's true in the Democratic Party and many places in the country. I, I want to put you a little bit on the spot here. We had a story this week about how Biden folks are keeping tabs of these people that are thinking about <laughs> yeah. running in 24. Yeah. Uh, look, I've known Joe, you've known Joe Biden longer than anybody at this table. I've known him a while. I know he feels disrespected and he has felt disrespected. And I think the chip is fair that he yeah. has on his shoulder. How the party treated him in, in 08, in 15 and 16, I get it. Is this what this is about? This feels weird to publicly let people know we're watching you, Gavin Newsom. <laughs> is that what this is about, though? Uh, it may be. You know, look, I, I really think that the president is doing the right thing by talking about running for re-election. He has been uh, in this game for a long time. He has seen numbers go up and down. He has seen, and, and right now he's got some head, uh, you know, headwinds facing, but he also has some wind at his back based on a number of things that are going on in the country. And I, I think that he is going to make this decision like he's always done. Mm -hmm. He's going to look at it on a personal level. He's going to talk to his family. Uh, and see where uh, he is. He's in a different place uh, now than he was even four years ago or two years ago. And I think he's going to look at that and, and all. But, but yeah, it's, I think politically, I think he's almost got to say, you know, we're watching, we're seeing, but he's also paying attention to what those potential candidates are saying and doing too and how the country is reacting to them and the policies. Nobody's running against Biden policies yet. No. You're not seeing that. If they're criticizing him, it's more personal, right? It's more personal. You're mm -hmm. not seeing him running against policies right. because he has done things, I think, that are pretty much what the mainstream America wants. He's not getting them all done because mm -hmm. of the dysfunction sometimes in Congress, but now he's getting some things done and has some wins under his belt. Sarah, is it too late for the Republicans to make this a referendum on Biden again, or has Trump's presence blunted that ability to make No, that. it's a referendum, Biden. We just came out with polling this week, and it shows that Biden's numbers are in the 30s. And Why hasn't it dragged tired. more Democrats down? It will. It just hasn't it caught on to them yet. Yeah, absolutely. People are tired of, of what Joe Biden is delivering to the American people. Inflation, gas prices, crime. All of these are scaring the American people, and they want to change. And that's why they're going to vote Republican in the fall. I'll tell you, Eugene, this was a week, I think, that the Biden folks thought was going to be a horrendous week. It turned out to be, I mean, even his recovery from COVID, I think in some ways was reaffirming of his own policies there. I mean, they, they turned what could have been a horrendous week into, thanks to Joe Manchin, a surprisingly good one. Indeed, and it's something that they are going to have to try to keep up longer to have press reflect that mm -hmm. and change, hopefully, for them some of the morale that voters have regarding this administration. But is there anything in this bill, you know, somebody made a mention, there's not anything in this bill that voters are going to feel before November. Is that a problem? Yes, in some ways, because whether or not it's actually a recession right now or a recession is coming, people feel like it's a recession. Mm -hmm. And if you can't make people feel like things are better or improving as soon as possible, they're going to vote as if they aren't. Doug, tell me how you would talk about this economy if you were on the trail. I'm talking about, I, I would be talking about the fact that d Democrats were at least trying to do something. There's not a single Republican candidate that I've seen that has done anything except complain. P best example, a couple weeks ago in an article about uh, the, the abortion decision mm -hmm. and how Republicans were wringing their hands. And it was a former Republican congressman who was quoted as saying, you know, we had everything going for us. Gas was at $5. Inflation was running rampant. They don't give a damn about the people. Mm. And so what they're looking at is the political thing. And I, I, I don't disagree that this could be a, a, a still problem. Still a referendum. For, yeah. yeah, still a referendum. But at the same time, I also give the pe people in the United States credit that they want to see people, they want to see leaders doing something for them. 
And, the, and that, in that context, the administration, mm -hmm. Democrats, are putting forth things mm -hmm. that are going to do, whether they feel it or not, and they are going to feel some of it. They have seen right now, you go to that gas pump, and yeah, you see a, a significant yeah. dip. I know, but be careful of riding gas prices. You oh, just I, I, never I, know. No, nobody. That's yeah. that, and especially with the, Europe, the European People are still comment. riding, though, right now, so I, they'll I, see. I get that. Yeah. Eugene, Doug, and Sarah, terrific panel. Thank you for spending a little bit of your Friday with me. Appreciate it. Up next, some missile strikes and a global food crisis. We're live in Kyiv as Ukraine rushes to export its first grain shipment since Russia invaded. It does look like they're turning the tide a little bit again against the Russians. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Ukraine and Russia are pointing fingers at each other after dozens of Ukrainian prisoners of war were reportedly killed in an airstrike last night in the Russian-controlled Donetsk region. NBC News has not been able to verify the allegations from either side, but they're pointing the fingers at each other. Russia's Ministry of Defense claims that it's Ukraine's missiles that struck the detention center that were holding captured Ukrainian servicemen, killed as many as 53 prisoners. Ukraine has pushed back on the Russian report, saying that it was Moscow that carried out the attack as a false flag, knowing they'd be killing Ukrainians, to cover up torture and abuse at that prison, and to accuse Ukraine of killing its own citizens. Ukraine's foreign minister called the alleged cover-up a petrifying war crime. Josh Letterman joins me with the latest from Kyiv. So, Josh, uh, how do you verify this one, and uh, is, is there any sense of, of a way that maybe uh, Western intelligence could have a better sense of how this went down? Well, I think we should say from the get-go, Chuck, that this is a very muddy situation right now, and it's going to take some time uh, for us to be able to get to the bottom of exactly what transpired here. The Russians say that the Ukrainian military used U.S.-supplied long-range weapons uh, to hit this prison camp that was holding uh, prisoners, Ukrainian fighters, uh, who had been holed up in that Azov steel plant in Mariupol uh, when the city ultimately fell to the Russians. Uh, but the Ukrainians say that makes absolutely no sense. And they're calling out uh, the Russians for their argument about why the Ukrainians uh, would have struck a prison holding their own prisoners of war. Now, the Russian claim here is a little bit convoluted, but I'll try to walk you through it. They say that the Ukrainian soldiers know that prisoners of war are treated so well by Russia that many of them are now laying down their arms voluntarily and surrendering, and that Ukraine bombed their own prisoners of war uh, in order to dissuade more of their soldiers uh, from surrendering. Now, the Ukrainians say they did not strike this facility in any way, shape, or form. Uh, and in fact, to your question about you know whether intelligence might shed some light on this, uh, the, in, the Secret Service for Ukraine says that they have conversations that they were able to intercept of Russian troops acknowledging that they were responsible for this. There's also been allegations from Ukrainian officials today that the Wagner Group, uh, a Russian paramilitary force, essentially an army for hire uh, run by an oligarch known to be close to President Putin, uh, was responsible for this attack. Tonight, President Zelensky met with his national security officials. He is calling for an investigation by the U.N., by the Red Cross, saying that there are clear war crimes that were committed here, Chuck. Josh Letterman, uh, on, uh, in Kyiv, on the front lines of this war. Josh, thank you. Hopefully, we can get some clarification on our side of what happened there. Uh, for sure. Let's turn now to some de troubling domestic climate-related news. In Kentucky, the death toll from catastrophic flooding is now up to 16. Uh, Kentucky's Governor Andy Bashir warned that the number is likely to get much higher as flooding is expected to continue this weekend. Just take a listen. This isn't over. I mean, while we're doing search and rescue, there are still real dangers out there. The water hasn't crested in some areas and won't um, until tomorrow. If you're able to hear us right now in eastern Kentucky, listen, we love you. We're going to make it. We've been through so much these last couple of years. We're going to stand next to you uh, now and in the years to come, and we'll get through this. We'll get through it together. Earlier today, President Biden approved a disaster declaration for the state. Jesse Kirsch joins me now from Jackson, Kentucky. So, Jesse, are the floodwaters still rising uh, or is there going to be some relief over the weekend? 
Well, Chuck, uh, and I just want to say I, I've just lost uh, the ability to hear you right now, which is part of the communication issue we've been having out here. So I apologize uh, if you try to cut in here, but I'll try to be brief. Um, at this point, it looks like the floodwaters where we are now are receding, which is good news uh, for these families because there are some people who have been staying here. And you can see how the, the line has, has moved throughout the afternoon, this, this part uh, of the, 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 the foliage here that is caked in mud. This is stuff that was underwater even just within the last hour or two. And we're starting to get a clear picture of everything. But if you still look out here, it's about 50 yards across with a current. It looks like a river, but that's just supposed to be dry land. And I want to show you this neighborhood over here. The water is receding. So some of these homes are getting out of the, the water completely. But at one point, a gentleman who lives in this home says that this is supposed to be an embankment about 20 feet up. But but now it is uh, partially submerged in water, and thankfully the water line is going down there, but he doesn't think he's going to be able to save anything that was in there. And you mentioned that the death toll is expected to climb. Uh, we do know that the death toll of children has already climbed. We are looking at now six children confirmed dead, according to the governor. He just announced that the latest briefing, uh, four more children who were confirmed dead. So that is just devastating in and of itself. And again, we are expecting those numbers to climb. There are hundreds of people who have been rescued both by boat and by air. There are people who have been taking kayaks in the street. There are obviously have been first responders making those rescues as well. But there are some people who have stayed in their homes. We've seen people in this neighborhood mm -hmm. stay put as well as down the road from here and here's what those people said to us i lost a sense of security i guess you could say you know we're always we lived here for years and water came up came down but we're getting less and less secure where you live now it's no longer you always have that frame in mind you're not going to be able to live here very long Stand by. And, Chuck, we're expecting more bad weather here in eastern Kentucky over the weekend, but tomorrow this area will be drying out, at least for a short time, Chuck. Jesse Kirsch on the ground for us. Jesse, thank you. Just, folks, when you hear about flood warnings now, take them more seriously. Maybe you didn't take them seriously 10 and 20 years ago, but this is why they're putting these warnings out more urgently. Take them seriously. These extreme weather events are bigger than we've ever experienced. After the break, progressive politics and party divisions, Democratic Congressman Ro Khanna joins me after the break on his party's surprisingly good week at a key moment. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back after weeks, months, even years of reporting that Democrats are in disarray. We can report today that Democrats appear to be, as I said earlier, in array. Wednesday brought us Joe Manchin's surprising announcement that he'd reached a deal with Chuck Schumer on a reconciliation package that was more than just fixing the Obamacare subsidies. And yesterday, the House passed legislation that would subsidize American-made semiconductor chips, sending it to President Biden's desk. But despite those positive de developments for Democrats in the White House, we also have received indications this week of the challenges that still remain, including a series of bad indicators about the state of the economy, like the news for that GDP fell for a second straight quarter, and a growing number of Democrats increasingly wary about the president seeking re-election in 24. As NBC News reported yesterday, President Biden's soft power has not been enough to stop would-be rivals from grabbing the 2024 spotlight. With me now is Congressman Ro Khanna. He's a Democrat from California, specifically representing Silicon Valley. And he's also a member of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. And yes, when you see the list of potential presidential candidates in the future, your name is on it. Congressman, it's good to see you. Great to be on. Uh, first, I want to start with the Manchin deal. Let me ask, and I, I'm hope, be, be honest with me. If this was the deal Manchin agreed to six months ago, would you have taken it? Yes, but not a year ago. Okay. All right. Not a year ago. But, you know, look, I was getting criticized from my own party. I started talking with Senator Manchin January 1st. I said on MSNBC, give him the pen. Let's have a smaller deal. Let's take the deal. I was part of his bipartisan group because I said, if we don't have Manchin, we're not going to get a climate. So deal. you might as well see where the, what the, the least, you know, what, what the least uh, uh, supportive senator is going to be for. You might as well see. And, and right. here's what I knew about Senator Manchin. He was going to be for the innovation funding. I had done a tech project in Beckley with him. He was always for the solar, the wind, the battery. He didn't like the sticks. Some of us want the sticks as well. Mm -hmm. He wanted some permitting reform. But I think he was always negotiating to get a deal. Are you OK with the fact that apparently one of the promises he was made is permitting reform? It's not going to be in the reconciliation, but it would be a separate bill, uh, which would basically help the fossil fuel industry um, uh, get over some environmental barriers if necessary. Well, look, it's not the bill I would have written, <laughs> uh, but is it 
on, whole, on the whole work taken? Yes, for two reasons. One, it's not just the billions of dollars mm -hmm. of spending. It's also the trillions it's going to unleash in the private sector. And that's, I think, what people don't under, are underestimating. Silicon Valley, all of the venture capital now is going to go in to, to clean tech. So maybe we'll have a bubble in this instead mm -hmm. of a bubble in cryptocurrency. That is huge. It could be transformative. The second thing on permitting reform is we do need some permitting reform. I mean, there is some uh, solar uh, mm -hmm. farms that are not being uh, go going through because of permitting. So... I'm for sensible permitting reform, lithium-ion processing, mm -hmm. let's have that, but not obviously the oil leases and the, the quid pro quo, but it's part of the deal. It's compromise. All right, when you host uh, one of your town halls in, in September October talking to your voters, you're on the ballot every two years, uh, and a voter asks, hey, how is this bill going to help me right now? What would you say? It's going to lower prescription drug costs. With and the they'll Medicare. see it this quickly, you think? I think they'll see it within a month. I okay. mean, not, yeah. not the next day. But yes, it's going to lower prescription drug costs. It's going to help uh, have new jobs in terms of the investment in clean energy. It's going to help make more things in the United States. And that's going to lower costs. I mean, the semiconductor bill. Look, mm -hmm. there are all these pickup trucks that need a semiconductor chip that aren't out being sold. And if you want to tackle inflation, let's make more stuff in America instead of shipping it from uh, overseas. I want to ask you about how you talk about this economy. And I say this, that I, I, I think there's been a lot of time spent on what to call it. And, and frankly, I think not enough time spent on sort of empathizing with what the reality is for the average American. It's a tough economy. Gas prices are up. Food prices are up. There's not baby formula still on the shelves. Mm -hmm. People are hurting. Uh, and you have to start with that. Then you start with, okay, what are we doing? The two things we're doing is we're going to make more things in America. We're not going to be dependent on a supply chain that is uh, in Europe, mm -hmm. in Russia, in China. People get that. They're like, yeah, after the pandemic, we need to need to mm -hmm. make more things here. That will bring down prices. And second, we need to take more aggressive action to bring down prices. The president released the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. I've said he should have a ban on exporting oil. Uh, and move back to what we had prior to 2015. I've said he should be, have been buying at the dip and selling back at cheap prices. We need to be more aggressive on food and uh, oil prices to bring them down. Are you worried about a false spike? There's been some, I mean, look, at the end of the day, you want to talk about a, a political problem, a new spike in gas prices in October, because what could happen with the oil markets internationally could be a problem. I think people are trying to foresee this and try to do something about it. How concerned are you that we're I'm not very on concerned. top of this? Yeah. I mean, I wrote a New York Times op-ed talking about preemptive buying. They dismissed the idea. I said, let's be buying the oil when it's at a cheaper price so that we can sell it back at a subsidized price. We've done this before. Now, if you have the European sanctions go into place and you have a price spike and it happens to be in October, that's going to be a big, big issue. It's going to outweigh all the good things we've done. So I think we have to be aggressive, either ban the export of oil, go after the... What about the gas tax holiday that he pr proposed? I mean, I know I wasn't a huge fan, but I've also wondered where did it go? Well, I, I, I don't think that's the, the, the answer, because I don't think mm -hmm. the answer is to drain the public treasury. I would rather do the windfall profits tax. I mean, just today, mm -hmm. Exxon and Chevron making record profits of this war. Why not tax them and put 300 bucks in the pockets of every American? Um, I want to ask you about some House business, the assault weapons ban. I had somebody ask me this, uh, uh, a local reporter asked me this earlier today. Why is the House trying to pass something that has no chance of, of going into the Senate? And I said, it's a fair question. So let me ask you, member of Congress, why are you guys passing something that you know can't pass this Congress? Well, we would pass almost nothing if, if, the, if, the, if the bar was what would fair pass enough. the Senate. But, but why on this? What's, why do you think this is important? Why is, why is this message important? Well, this is, I mean, after the massacres we've seen, after the mass shootings we've seen, you talk to young people in my district, they care about two things, climate and guns. They're mm -hmm. traumatized by it. They want to see their representatives doing something. And Chuck, you've been in Washington long enough to know you pass things over and over again. You pass them in the House. Eventually, they move. So this builds the political support. I mean, look, in the six years I've been in Congress, we haven't had the votes to pass an assault weapons ban. So the fact that you guys are going to be able to do this with your own party in your mind, is a step. It's a huge step. I mean, they, there's now more of a consensus, at mm -hmm. least among Democrats, to pass this. That's progress from six years. Now we have to get the Senate. Is the 2024 talk on the Democratic side uh, a good thing or a bad thing for the party? It's neither here nor there. But I, I think here's what the reality is. Joe Biden is the incumbent president. Uh, you support the incumbent president of your own party. You're going to support the incumbent president if he runs for re-election. I am. Hard stop, right? I am, yes. Okay. And, and I, I mean, the other speculation, 
uh, you know, my, my view is that Joe Biden should start talking about the accomplishments, about the economy, tune out all the other noise. They're just helping build our profiles. All right. <laughs> You're going to support him. Should he run again? That's up to him and, and his, uh, his family. You, I, you must have an opinion. I, my view is that uh, he beat Donald Trump. No one else beat Donald Trump. I still think Donald Trump is the most formidable candidate against us. And he has the judgment to make that decision. Here's what I do believe about Joe Biden. I don't think he would put the country or the party through this if he really thought there was someone else who had a better shot of beating Donald Trump. That's a judgment he's going to have to make. And he's entitled to make it since he's the only one who's ever done that. Ro Khanna, Democrat from uh, Silicon Valley. Thanks for coming on. Thank, Thank you. you. Still ahead, lessons from a legend reflecting on Pete Williams' storied career here at NBC News. He's ready to ride off into the Wyoming sunset. He'll be here next. You're watching Meet the President. Welcome back. As you probably heard by now, Pete Williams, or as I sometimes like to call him here, Lewis, <laughs> is retiring. That's because he likes to call me Charles. For nearly <laughs> three decades, we're, we're giving a hint of our real first names, right? In nearly three decades here at NBC News, Pete has covered the Supreme Court, the Justice Department, and much more as our justice correspondent. It's the best of the beat. But don't call him NBC's chief justice correspondent because, as Pete says, he covers a whole lot more than just the chief justice. Anyway, when it comes to some of the biggest Supreme Court decisions, Pete broke them down better and faster than anyone else. But there's no doubt here, Tom. There's just no way that the court thinks a recount is possible. And, and we should say again, uh, obviously the justices have had more than 24 hours to prepare this rather splintered up opinion. It's, it's in many sections, but there's no question it is a 5-4 vote. Historic ruling here. For the first time, the Supreme Court has said there is a constitutional right <coughs> Excuse me, to same-sex marriage. You can hear the cheer in the crowd. A very dramatic moment here. So the bottom line here is the Supreme Court has upheld the health care law. And when it came to reporting on some of the FBI's most important investigations, Pete always had the inside scoop. He's the consummate journalist, best kind of colleague, and also our resident jokester. He's earned the respect and admiration, <laughs> not only all of us, but those he's covered as well. Just this week, when the Attorney General Merrick Garland sat down for an exclusive interview with uh, Lester Holt, he called Pete a fantastic reporter who tells the American people the straight truth. Mr. Williams, uh, you getting tired of uh, everybody saying nice things? <laughs> oh, yeah, no, I can't hear can possibly you, enough. You, you want to retire every week, right? <laughs> it, 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 look, um, does it feel like it's ending? It feels like an out-of-body experience. Yeah, you know, it, it feels like, you know, uh, they're, they're talking about somebody else. I'm sure it'll soak in in a while. But uh, yeah, it's, I've been thinking about it for weeks and weeks and weeks. And now that it's actually here, there's an air of unreality about it. Yeah, a little bit of regret, I hope. Oh, sure. Yes, yeah. I know I'll miss the work, but this is the right time for me to step away while my legs are still working and I can still get around a little bit and do some other things. You know, I think about your beat. Um, I assume the most intellectually pleasing is the, the Supreme Court beat in, in many ways because it's such a high minded. I assume the hardest stuff is the school shootings. Oh, and yeah. all the shootings. I mean, when you have I've never the part that I never envied in your beat yeah. is when there was a shooting. It always takes a little bit out of you every time. Uh, and, you know, I had a really tough time covering the Boston Marathon bombing and the trial especially, to sit there day after day and have these people come in and say how the bombing had shattered their lives and, and they have shrapnel in them that they'll carry with them for the rest of their lives, loved ones that they've lost. Uh, on the other hand, the redeeming part of it, of course, was the great resilience of Boston. Mm -hmm. uh, and... Uh, but you're right. Those things are just and they're so inexplicable and they're so senseless. Uh, it, there's, you know, there's obviously no joy in those things. It's just a matter of trying to get it right. You know, your beat um, really relies on having public servants who seem to put the public over their own politics here. And yet the distrust people have of government. How would you if somebody in, in Wyoming, there are plenty of people who probably think the government's always lying. <laughs> How would you tell them to say, you know, a government doesn't lie to you as much as you think? What would be some examples you'd give them? You're on a beat that I feel like where government's the most honest. Yeah, well, I think, you know, first of all, I think people overuse this term lie. Let's mm -hmm. think about what a lie is. It's an intentional mistruth. It's, it's knowing one thing and saying the opposite or saying something different. Whereas people are sometimes mistaken. You know, the first information people have turns out to be wrong. Uh, I can't say that over my career of 29 years at NBC, I have been lied to very often. 
Misled, yes, but usually people who were trying to do the right thing. Um, and, and I think that's uh, I think that's generally true of the people that I've dealt with in the government. They really want to make sure you get get it right. Well, uh, I'm not done with you, um, but I'm <laughs> done with this. I will see you Sunday. <laughs> yes, sir. For one more. Uh, I'm just going to stay here. You just stay here. That'd yeah. be good. Well, we'll I got a room in the back. Pitch a tent. It's good. Okay. Uh, Thanks very much. And we'll see you on Sunday. We'll get Pete's lessons and reflections on today's current news as well. And I've put them on my po- podcast as well. You can't get enough Pete Williams as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Although we may prove that wrong. Well, we're, you know what? I'd like to find that out. <laughs> I'll let you know if we're I close. hit I'll let you know if I hit that barrier. <laughs> Thank you all for being with us this hour. We'll be back Monday with more Meet the Press now. And I'll see you Sunday with my co-host, Pete Williams, on Meet the Press and your local NBC News station. NBC News Now coverage continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.